Well, as most of you know by now, there was a big brawl on Bill Maher's show on Friday night, and none of them were even drinking yet. The man who got it all started is my first guest tonight. An explosive exchange. Friday night's heated exchange. After Ben Affleck, TV host Bill Maher, and author Sam Harris had an explosive exchange. Hot debate. Should we be able to criticize Islam? We have to be able to criticize bad ideas. Islam but why this would... is the mother load of bad ideas. What Sam Harris said was outrageous. I do think it's racist. It is gross and racist. It's, yeah. it's gross. It's racist. It's not. It's But it's so it's nuts. So, it's like... We need to get beyond this shallow debate. This is what Islam is. This is what Muslim people are. There's ISIS, there's global jihadists. The Muslims are this, or the Muslims are that. How about the more than a billion those, people those who are aren't Muslims fanatical? Too. The conversation will no doubt continue. Will certainly continue for better and for worse. You're not listening Absolutely to not. what we are saying. It's not often that a TV talk show argument gets talked about more than a few minutes after that TV show ends, but a batch of articles continue to appear today, including Nick Kristof's in the New York Times, about the argument that Ben Affleck and Nick Kristof had with Bill Maher and Sam Harris on Bill Maher's show on Friday night, an argument that Nick Kristof said today was, quote, a TV brawl. We have been sold this meme of Islamophobia where every criticism of the doctrine of Islam gets conflated with bigotry toward Muslims as people. Right. And that is uh, it's, it's intellectually ridiculous. Why are you so hostile to, about this it's, yeah. it's gross. It's racist. It's, it's not. It's, but it's so nuts. It's, so, it's like saying it's those so not you're a shifty Jew. You're not listening Absolutely to not. what well, we are saying. You guys are saying, if you want to be liberals, believe in liberal principles, right. like freedom of speech, like, right. um, you know, we are endowed by our uh, forefathers with an inalienable life, like all men are created. No. Ben, we have to be able to criticize bad ideas. And of course we Islam, do. No liberal doesn't okay, want to okay. criticize bad ideas. But Islam but why this when, is the mother load of bad ideas. Jesus. So we have, we have That's ideas just a like slam. There are hundreds of millions of Muslims who are nominal Muslims, who don't take the faith seriously, who don't want to kill apostates, who are horrified by ISIS, and we need to defend these people, prop them up, and let them reform. Dude, you're talking, ISIS like couldn't like fill a double-A ballpark in Charleston, West Virginia, and you are making a career no, no. out of ISIS, 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 ISIS. But no, 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 it's not no, just ISIS, not. it's all jihadists. It's global, it's a phenomenon it's of global a, jihad. I, this May is such a caricature of it Indonesia, of Malaysia, okay, wait a so minute. much of the world. And this does have the tinge a little bit of the way white racists talk about African-Americans. Joining me now is Sam Harris, whose new book is Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion. His first book, The End of Faith, won the 2005 Penn Award for nonfiction. Sam, I just want to give you the rules of, uh, of discussion on this show. Mm. When I shout over you, you must immediately stop and agree with me, okay, in order to continue the discussion. All right, I thanks, Sam. Okay. You're, you're even uh, harder than Ben Affleck. It is. It's going to be, it's going to be yeah. a tough one. So, uh, you know, I've been reading what uh, Nick Kristoff has uh, written about this today and what other critics of you have written yeah. about this today. And there's something fascinating in every one of those articles. And that is how much they agree with you. I, I want to read you a passage from Nick Kristoff's uh, column today. Uh, and this is something that I swear, if it had no author's name on it, I would expect to see the, the name Sam Harris somewhere near it. He says, today the Islamic world includes a strain that truly is disproportionately intolerant and oppressive. Barbarians in the Islamic State cite their faith as the reason for their monstrous behavior, most recently beheading a British aid worker devoted to saying, saving Muslim lives, and give all Islam a bad name. Moreover, of the 10 bottom ranking countries in the world economic forums report on women's rights, nine are majority Muslim in Afghanistan, Jordan, and Egypt. More than three quarters of Muslims favor the death penalty for Muslims who renounce their faith. According to a Pew survey, the persecution of Christians, Ahmadis, Yazidis, Baha'i, and Shiites is far too common in the Islamic world. Uh, and Sam, when I read that, and when yeah. I listen to that discussion that went on Friday night, it seems to me that the key line in it was when Bill Maher said, you're not listening to us. And I, and I, I think that's easy to happen in those kinds of TV back and forth. Uh, but it, yeah. it's, 
it's so interesting how much you, you all actually agree where the areas of agreement actually are. Well, and the irony is that even when someone like Nick Kristof thinks he's not agreeing with me, he's actually proving my point. So he's, he's arguing that, that we're not acknowledging all the people who are making heroic efforts to reform the faith or to criticize so-called extremism. But then he goes on to say how, how much courage this takes because their lives are in danger in, in, in dozens of Muslim, Muslim countries merely for advocating for human rights, which of course proves my point. That The point is that there's a, what we're calling radical Islam or extremist Islam or fundamentalist Islam is massively well subscribed in the Muslim world and there are, there are reams of, of polling data to, to attest to this, mostly the, the Pew polls but also Gallup polls. And so he'll cite a country like Indonesia as being the the poster child for, for Muslim moderation, and it is, it is uh, moderate compared to Pakistan or Sudan or Saudi Arabia, but 70% of Indonesians want to live under Sharia law, and uh, when you ask specific questions about what, uh, how, what sorts of pu punishments they want enforced, 40% want adulterers stoned to death. Now it's true only 16% want apostate stone to death, but that, that's the best, more or less the best results you get on that question in the Muslim world, uh, with the exception of a place like Albania. So uh, when you look at any of these specific questions, and this is, this is my argument, that specific beliefs have consequences, uh, you have a, a, a really terrifying level of subscription to very scary ideas like apostates should be killed or blasphemers should be killed or the Danish cartoonists should have been killed or prosecuted. These are in, in many, many countries. These numbers are up around 70 percent, 80 percent in places like Pakistan. And we have to talk honestly about it. This is not the fringe of the fringe. This is this is this is mainstream. It may not be mainstream in Los Angeles or New York, but it is mainstream worldwide for Islam. Well, there's always a, a huge gap uh, between beliefs and acting on beliefs, I think, in this kind of arena in particular. Uh, and, and so that, that's another part of this that I think the, the, the other side of the debate that you're in, which, as I say, is, is with people who largely agree with you, uh, it, it includes, I think, that notion that, that, that they feel on their side of the table that that you are saying that these people that, that poll says therefore that Indonesians are ready to go out there and behead people well I, you know, this is something I asked uh, in the green room after our our fight on on uh, the panel uh, in response to Nick and, and Ben's point that there's so many people who stand up against Isis there have been demonstrations there, there's a hashtag not in our name but I asked both of them you know, what would have happened if we had burned a Quran on tonight's show? And they knew what would happen. There would be riots in scores of countries. Embassies would likely burn. People would certainly get killed. And we would spend the rest of our lives hiding from theocrats uh, under a credible threat of death. Now, that's just a fact. It's a fact that neither of them would deny. Uh, and yet, what we have in response to ISIS, uh, ISIS who is crucifying people by the side of the road, uh, raping women by the thousands, torturing women, and, and burying children alive, in the name of Islam, we have a hashtag and we have some demonstrations. Now, I, I support the hashtag, I support some those demonstrations, but we need a groundswell of repudiation of this kind of behavior. And the problem is, and I'm not denying that some people repudiate it, and many millions of Muslims are horrified, but the problem is, ISIS is behaving in a way that is sanctioned by a literal reading of the Quran and the Hadith. You can, you can take sex slaves among the infidels. You should cut the infidels' heads off. This, this is a plausible version of, of the faith. And it's not a plaus plausible version of, of Buddhism. You know, so the comparison to the, the, the Buddhists who are in Myanmar now killing Muslims is, is a facile one because uh, the, these Buddhists are killing Muslims. It's horrible. It is a, it is a sign of tribal violence, but it is not a sign of, the, of the implement, an honest implementation of the doctrine of Buddhism. You can't find anywhere in the Pali Canon that tells you to go uh, uh, re destroy the lives of innocent people. 
that is something that, that ISIS is doing, and they are doing it uh, very much in a paint-by-numbers way. Uh, and the, 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 the challenge is for Muslims to speak honestly about this and to reform the faith, find a way of contextualizing these beliefs and, and reinterpreting them. And there are Muslims who are doing that. Irshad Manji is doing that. Uh, Majid Nawaz is doing that. I, I totally support these people. Uh, but the Muslims who get on television, people like Reza Aslan and, and the liberal apologists like Glenn Greenwald and, and Nicholas Kristof, who say that this has nothing to do with Islam, ISIS or al-Qaeda, they're, they're just playing hide the ball with the articles of faith, and I think that is dishonest and, and ultimately dangerous for all of us. Well, w one of the things they're saying, Sam, uh, is that there are many articles of faith in the Quran and in the Bible, and there are passages in the Bible uh, that say, you know, uh, the penalty for adultery is uh, death, and That's there true. are passages in the Quran that say you, you should not kill anyone, and then there are other passages that say for certain reasons you should. But you mentioned Reza Aslan. Here's what he wrote about this, about your, in, in writing about your argument on television, mm -hmm. under the headline, Bill Maher isn't the only one who misunderstands religion. Under that headline, he writes, people of faith are far too eager to distance themselves from extremists in their community, often denying that religious violence has any religious motivation whatsoever. This mm -hmm. is especially true of Muslims. Now, yes. Sam, uh, I if, saw if, I saw yeah. Bill if I saw Bill's name attached to that, or if I saw your name attached to that, I would think, yeah, that, that's pretty much what they're saying. Well, I, I give Reza credit for making that point. I think that was very much in response to the blog post I wrote the day before. Uh, but he, he usually doesn't make that point, and there are many things in his article that take that take that point back. For instance, he says that no religion is intrinsically violent; it's all a matter of interpretation. And Buddhism is just as potentially violent as Islam. And he cited the Burmese Buddhists, and all of that just muddied the message. The, the, the basic point that most people want to believe is that all religions are equally benign or, or equally irrelevant. They all more or less teach the same thing when they're wise. They teach the same thing when they're not wise. And for the most part, people, good people will be good and bad people will be ba bad with or w without religion. And that, that it's all a matter of politics and culture and economics. And religion is never really pulling the strings of human behavior. No one's really blowing themselves up in a crowd of children because they think they're going to get to paradise and get 72 virgins. The problem is everything I just said in that paragraph is false. And we have to grapple with this fact. People really believe these things and they are really motivated by their beliefs. And if you believe that the Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe, it is absolutely rational to hate the infidel, to think that the infidel is going to just burn in hell for eternity, and that's a good thing because God wants it that way. And you should spread the one true faith to the ends of the earth, and you are at, in a perpetual state of war against unbelievers. That is, that is arguably one of the central messages of the Quran. It's not the only message, as you point out, and there are a few lines, like there's, there's no, no compulsion in religion, for instance, which you can hold up against that tide of, of animosity, and but reformist Muslims have to do that. They, but they, they have uh, they don't have as many tools as we would want them to have. And uh, we just have to speak honestly about that. And we have to encourage liberal voices in the Muslim world. Sam, I think uh, one of the things we are talking about here, uh, or, or, or that's involved here, is the maturation curves of religions. Christendom uh, was once a pretty murderous operation. Uh, they, yeah. they, the Inquisition was all about murdering people for not being uh, good Christians and not being convincing Christians after they had uh, converted. Uh, just conversion wasn't good enough. And so, so, uh, but but what happened at some point was that Christianity matured out of that thinking and they matured out of thinking that the penalty for not observing the Sabbath should be death and so no one is killed anywhere in the world now for not observing the Sabbath no one is stoned to death for right. that anymore and so I guess what, what I'm looking at when I look at at this situation now uh, with uh, this fanatical interpretations of passages of the Quran is when and how will will that same maturation curve be followed uh, in Islam? Well, the first thing to point out is we don't have centuries to wait for this process. It took centuries, as you say, and, and it yes. was based on the collision with science and secular human rights and, and secular ethics. Uh, it took a long time. We need, we need to hasten this process through honest conversation.
And, and I mean, another, another part of it is it simply became unbearable in, in Western yeah. society. Uh, th that was another one of the factors. It was unbearable to live like this. Uh, here in this country, uh, burning witches at the stake in my home state of Massachusetts. Yeah, and, I, and I, would, I should point out that no one is suffering under the excesses of Islamic dogmatism more than Muslims. It's, it's yes. it, it are the Muslims of the world who are suffering this far more than the West is. And it's out of compassion for them that we should try to inspire a renaissance and a reformation in the Muslim world. Sam Harris, thank you very much for joining me tonight. And uh, I wanted to make sure you were able to finish your sentences tonight. Yeah, thank you so much, Lawrence. Okay. Pleasure. Thanks, Sam.